Um, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're joining us from. We cordially welcome you all for the third inspiration lecture uh, of the Center for Research in Emerging Economics at Jindal Global Business School. Uh, we have other uh, center members with us today. I'm uh, Dr. Chitta Galsen. I'll be moderating the session. I'm an associate professor of economics uh, at Jindal Global Business School. We have Dr. Aniran Ganguly, Dr. Suganna Balakumar, Dr. Meenakshi Tomar from the center with us. Um, uh, today, we have Dr. Uh, Venu Kakar with us. She's from San Francisco State University. And she'll be discussing her paper titled The Visible Host Does Race Guide Airbnb Rental Rates in San Francisco? Uh, and in this lecture, she'll be discussing about potential racial discrimination in Airbnb properties in San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Kakar is an associate professor of economics at the Lamb Family College of Business, San Francisco State University. She has earned her MA and PhD from University of California at Riverside with a focus in macroeconomics and econometrics, and her BA from Lady Shriram College, University of Delhi. Um, she has previously worked in the area of development economics at the World Bank and the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in India. Dr. Kakar's research is on topics that overlap with consumer finances, housing, economic growth, and inequality, linkages between monetary policy and financial conditions, and economic demography. Her scholarly work has been widely published in journals such as Economic Modeling, Journal of Consumers Affairs, Journal of Housing Economics, etc. She has also been interviewed about her research on Marketplace Weekend, a popular show on National Public Radio, and her work has been uh, disseminated in prestigious outlets such as the Journalist Resource of Harvard Kennedy School and the National Affairs Magazine. She teaches courses in macroeconomics, econometrics, and forecasting, and more recently she has started the Big Data Summer Program at SFSU. Uh, so, without taking uh, more time, I would invite uh, Dr. Cocker to start with her presentation. Dr. Cocker, the stage is all yours now. And uh, you know, before we begin, you know, for the uh, attendees, you know, just uh, you know, a couple of you know, housekeeping, simple housekeeping rules. Just keep your uh, mic muted. Please make sure that your mic is not turned on at any point of time, and you know, keep your webcams off. If you have any question at any point of time, you can share those in the chat box, and we will. At the end of the lecture, we will take those questions. Okay, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dagger. Sorry for interrupting you. It's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for this very kind introduction and uh, for this invitation and for organizing all of this. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, so um, as, as Dr. Sen just mentioned, my talk is on the visible host, does race guide Airbnb rental rates in San Francisco? Uh, this is joint work with my former students, uh, Joel Bowles, Julia Vu, and Julissa Franco uh, of San Francisco State University. And this was, uh, a, you know, this, this uh, topic and this uh, research is close to my heart because it was uh, my first paper with uh, my graduate students and it was started in one of my econometrics classes. Um, so very happy to present this. Um, I plan to speak for about 35 to 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, in case there are any burning questions, uh, any clarifying questions, you can write to Dr. Sen and uh, he can ask that uh, on your behalf. Uh, any open ended questions can be left for the end. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, let me motivate my talk uh, by showing you this really famous cartoon that was uh, published or that was ran by the New Yorker in July of 1993. Um, and it features two dogs, as you can see, one sitting on, on a computer surfing the web uh, and telling the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, right? And so this cartoon has been reproduced um, so many times since then. And uh, while it was ahead of its time in 1993, uh, because the internet was still evolving, um, you know, it, with the evolution of the World Wide Web, uh, it did tell us that the internet is a place where people can get, uh, can get an anonymity uh, or can be anonymous. So what have we seen since then? Of course, uh, with anonymous e-commerce, uh, which was internet enabled uh, and was a growing market, um, 
this, this created a lot of opportunities. And in the United States alone, uh, about $343 billion uh, worth of sales uh, was, was contributed by just anonymous e-commerce, okay? And so there are studies, many, many different studies that talked about how uh, being anonymous on the internet and transacting or making business transactions actually reduced uh, discrimination, okay? And so Zettelmeyer's study that I mentioned here actually looked at the automobile market. But since then, we have seen that there is this personalization in e-commerce that has taken place. And so that's a recent trend, and it, it has been a growing sub-area or growing niche of uh, uh, e-commerce. And it's also called peer-to-peer e-commerce. You might have come across this term. And there are many different websites that uh, uh, transact or, or that uh, uh, contribute to this marketplace. So there's eBay and Craigslist uh, uh, in the United States that's uh, UX. But this was the cartoon that I was talking about, the two dogs talking to each other. Um, and, uh, you know, one saying to the other that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And so it's basically talking about the fact that the internet uh, was a place where people could be anonymous. And so this anonymity um, reduced transaction discrimination. There were studies talking about that. Uh, Zettelmeyer's study talked about uh, this type of reduced discrimination in the automobile market. Uh, and since then, we've seen this uh, trend in e-commerce, which is called peer-to-peer e-commerce, or you know, the personalization in e-commerce, which is, um, uh, you know, examples are websites like eBay and Craigslist that uh, buy or sell used goods, or platforms where these types of transactions take place. There's Etsy, which was more recently listed in the uh, top 500 companies in the United States uh, by market cap. Uh, and this was trading in crafts. There's TaskRabbit, very similar to uh, Urban Clap that we have in India, uh, which is uh, for services. And then there's Airbnb and many other companies, but Airbnb being a, a dominant player in the room rental markets, marketplace. So all of these websites have something in common um, that buyers and sellers uh, usually would post biographical information uh, and so when you transact uh, at this on this website, you can discern the race, the gender, and many other different uh, characteristics of the party through images, uh, videos, audios, etc. So the intent of, of this uh, type of personalization is that uh, buyers and sellers, they're strangers, and so this transaction becomes more palatable and it facilitates, uh, facilitates trust, it decreases uh, any type of purchase risk that's associated with the transaction and just gives you a personalized experience. But then there's this unintended consequence, which is that now the transaction becomes less anonymous and it's more like a face-to-face -face, uh, transaction, uh, business transaction, uh, much like what you would experience at a brick and mortar store where discrimination becomes possible. So our study is really rooted in this idea. So let's focus on Airbnb. This is what we look at. Um, um, this, is a dominant, uh, this is a dominant player in the rental market. Of course, these statistics are from the time the study was conducted. Airbnb is a, a billion dollar company today uh, and, and might even release have its IPO this year, okay? Uh, and so our focus is on uh, the short-term internet room rental market in which Airbnb is dominant. Uh, and, and you know, if you look at the statistics uh, that there's over 60 million uh, total guests, its presence is in uh, th over 34,000 cities and over 191 countries, over 2 million listings worldwide, you know that this, is, uh, this company is a dominant player in this marketplace. And so all of these statistics tell us that this is comparable to major hotel chains like uh, the Intercontinental, the Marriott, et cetera. So our main question was then, what are the effects of having biographical information like the host race, gender, sexual orientation, uh, even couple status on Airbnb price listings? And in particular, we look at San Francisco. We, I mean, at each San Francisco, my students were, uh, interested in San Francisco, and we'll talk about why we chose San Francisco um, uh, for other reasons. 
So here is a sample Airbnb listing. In fact, I actually stayed in this uh, Airbnb, the only Airbnb I ever stayed in. This was in Los Angeles. And uh, you know, right when you uh, log in and you, uh, you want to book, you see these uh, types of pictures where you can see um, maybe a picture of the uh, listing itself. And there are many other pictures down here. Um, you see uh, some attributes of the host here. So there's a host photo. If you click on it, I'll show you in a second what that looks like. Uh, but if you click on the host photo, you can get much more information about the host. And then you have many other rental listing features which describe the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, um, where um, is it located, uh, and a little blurb about you know, what the listing is. And you know, down here, you can see that um, you know, if you're a potential renter on Airbnb, then you can also look at reviews from prior guests that might tell you about their experiences and drive your decision in whether you would rent from this potential Airbnb host or not. Okay, so here is a sample Airbnb host profile. I'll give you a few seconds to take a look at this. And this is from San Francisco. So notice here that this is Doug's uh, Airbnb host profile. Uh, Doug lives in San Francisco, California and has been a member since July, 2013. Um, Doug talks about, uh, you know, how long uh, he's lived in San Francisco and uh, where this is, uh, where this Airbnb listing is uh, located. Uh, it, he talks about his partner, Richard. So you know from here that he's in a domestic partnership. You can talk about, you know, we can infer that uh, this is a couple. And uh, we also know about their hobbies, like their foodies and vine enthusiasts, etc. We also can see how many reviews they have. So there's 152 reviews over here that you can read and also that they have verified um, social media pages. So this is a sample Airbnb uh, host profile that we draw our data from. This is just one of the data sources. So let me talk about you know, where in the broad literature uh, on housing discrimination our study fits in. So there are three areas that I'll talk about. The first one is very, very large, and I don't have enough time to go through it, but I'll give you the essence of it. The first one is on discrimination in traditional housing markets. And so a lot of the studies um, that contribute to this, this issue uh, focus on the supply side. Um, and, and what they find is that mostly minorities in the United States are shown or learn about fewer housing units are denied or given limited access to housing and even charge higher prices for identical housing or loans than their white counterparts. So this comes out of the traditional housing market literature. The other strand of literature is uh, discrimination in the peer-to-peer e-commerce -peer e marketplace. Like I had mentioned before that this has created opportunities and pitfalls uh, because of that personalization. And finally, we will look at discrimination in the peer-to-peer -peer room rental marketplace uh, of Airbnb, right? So for the last two bullets, I'm going to show you some examples of studies. Uh, one study that was really, really famous uh, was called The Visible Hand, Race and Online Market Outcomes. Uh, that was published in 2013. And as you would notice, the title of our talk, The Visible Host, uh, you know, is, is drawn from this. So uh, The Visible Hand, what what did it do? It looked at demand side discrimination. Uh, in, in the study, the authors posted online classified ads um, for selling iPad nanos on hundreds and hundreds of local U US websites. Okay, so here you see um, uh, these uh, ads and you know, with, that they were posted with pictures and I'll talk about that in a second. But their main question was, what is the effect of the sellers skin color on outcomes like bid price of the iPod, iPod Nano. And so like you can see ads featured are dark versus light skinned hand, um, a, a wrist tattoo as well uh, on a white hand. Uh, whereas, you know, 
all of, all of the other characteristics of the iPod Nano remain fixed, okay? And so what did the study find? The study found that black sellers received 13% fewer responses and lower offers than white sellers. And, uh, you know, quantitatively, the effects were similar for sellers that had a tattoo on their hand versus those without. So again, this is showing you uh, that for the same iPod, uh, you had different bid prices. Another study um, uh, that was called What's in a Picture uh, looked at the effect of loan applicants' personal information, um, including a picture on their acceptance rate for, uh, for a loan in the peer-to-peer -peer lending site called Prosper.com. So again, you know, when a potential applicant uh, is, uh, is uh, transacting on Prosper.com, they had to put up their picture. And this picture could tell um, someone who's a lender about the race, the gender, the age, uh, and all of these different attributes about the applicant. And so that affected the likelihood of receiving the funding and also the interest rate that was charged on the loan. Okay, so what this study found was that black applicants had a 30% lower chance of getting funded versus their white counterparts, right, for the same exact uh, application. And then interest rates offered to black applicants were in fact 60 to 80 basis points higher than white counterparts with similar credit profiles. So again, this is showing you um, potential discrimination. Okay, so let's turn to Airbnb and, uh, you know, the first study that was done on Airbnb and looking at this type of an issue was in New York City. And so they were testing for racial discrimination against Airbnb hosts in New York City. Uh, and so just like I'd shown you before, you have the host profile page and you can infer the race of the host um, either through their photo or their name or other things that they list or talk about in their, in their blurb. So they looked at, uh, they, they tried to ask, you know, the same type of question, is there any effect of, of race on Airbnb listing prices? And their controls included all of what a potential renter would see on the Airbnb uh, host profile or on, on that platform. And so their um, results, indicated that prices of Airbnb listings of non-Black hosts are approximately 12% higher than Black hosts. So you can imagine that this is going to create some disparities in revenues that hosts can accumulate. Right? So our study builds on this and we look at the San Francisco market, which has a very different racial composition than New York City. Um, we look at all racial groups, Asian, Hispanic, Black, Whites, and other uh, groups that we couldn't characterize. We look at other attributes like gender, sexual orientation, uh, couple status, uh, et cetera, that could have an effect on price. And we also, you know, uh, to, to make our uh, set of variables that affect prices richer, we add a lot of neighborhood uh, controls. So things like real estate values, like price per square foot, you know, where your Airbnb is located in the city, area demographics, which tells you about uh, the percentage of Asian population in your area or white population in your area, things like that. Um, incomes, median incomes in your neighborhood, things like that. And then we, we control for occupancy rates, which can also drive prices. So you can imagine that, you know, if you're a, a a host, then your decision to list a price is also dependent on your past occupancy uh, for that listing. So in which uh, case, you know, if your occupancy is low, then, uh, then you would, uh, the price is going to be lower. Things like that. And we also offer alternative explanations for the differences uh, that we observe uh, in prices across racial groups. And so the, uh, I think there's this one really famous New York City study and then uh, motivated from that study was another study that was done in Oakland, which is a city uh, northeast of, uh, of San Francisco in which they employed a similar methodology, but looked at really a, a neighborhood in, in Oakland, which was racially balanced and 
again found that there were price differences of at least 20% uh, between Asian and white hosts. So Asian hosts were receiving 20% less, or at least price their units 20% less than whites for similar listings. And so our studies focused on the entire San Francisco market and we look at all neighborhoods. So let me finish the lit literature review here uh, by talking about a Finnish study. So this uh, study was conducted in Finland where um, the authors uh, did the qualitative or did qualitative interviews with Airbnb hosts. And uh, the question that was asked was, what are your motivations for hosting uh, on Airbnb? So as you would imagine, one, um, direct uh, motivation is economic right so this if you're a host on airbnb and you rent out uh, your uh, a room or um, you know an, an entire apartment that gives you supplemental income uh, and the other um, motivation was social so people talked about how they would meet interesting people who were traveling um, to finland etc and there was some other uh, uh, discussion around pricing strategies. So how do you price your Airbnb listing? And so uh, the results or the findings from here was that you price high to attract professionals or avoid problematic guests. Um, so let's say there's a fair price and you, you, know, you have a plus delta on top of that, which is the premiums you're pricing higher or you're pricing lower to maximize the pool of potential guests to choose from um, that can help you maybe maximize occupancy. So they, this suggests there are, that there are several alternative explanations to racial discrimination uh, for, uh, for price listing differences. So let me talk about uh, the data that we use. So here is a map of San Francisco and our data, a lot of our data comes from inside Airbnb, which is a third party website. This is not affiliated with Airbnb in any way, uh, but does collect uh, data on listings, prices, and many other types of features like room type, uh, etc. So we looked at San Francisco, right? You can see that filter here that we applied back in 2015 when we started this study. This was, um, this gave us 6,361 listings in total, okay? And here you can see on the map itself, there are these red dots which signify that all of these listings were actually entire homes or apartments that were rented out. So about 57, 58% of um, entire listings were uh, in this area. Okay, and then you have um, these green dots, which are um, private rooms. So people uh, can rent out a private room. This included a bathroom uh, for most people. Okay, and, and then the blue dots, which are really few, maybe more uh, in areas that are tourist attractions, uh, are shared rooms, okay? And so what we did after this was that we applied certain filters and we had selected from this sample minimum listings that had a minimum of five reviews, a verified ID and picture, because that was what we were interested in, and, and then generated a neighborhood weighted. So, Let's take a look here. Um, there are, um, you know, what we get in the end is uh, about 800 listings and each host uh, listing was manually examined. And I have to give kudos to my students here because they did this uh, painstakingly. Uh, you know, this was a tedious process to generate uh, and identify the host race, gender, uh, single or couple status, sexual orientation. They looked at each listing and they generated it. Uh, this data. Let me talk about you know how important neighborhood values are in San Francisco. It, it is a city that is one of the most expensive cities in the world to live in. But then again, if you look at different neighborhoods, uh, it really makes a difference of where uh, what the values are. Uh, some very expensive neighborhoods tend to be residential, and some that are very expensive tend to be in um, near tourist attraction. And so here we see that there is a big range in property values uh, if you if you measure in uh, measure that in dollars per square feet um, 
the most inexpensive areas would be $644 per square foot. And then the other, uh, the richest ones, like here you see the financial distri district in dark orange, uh, are uh, to the tune of $1,548 per square feet. Okay, so where the Airbnb listing is would matter for the price. That's the point I'm trying to make. And so here's another um, uh, map which shows you Airbnb sample distribution by neighborhood and race. So there are all these different neighborhoods and you can see that the blue dots are Airbnb listings by uh, whites. Okay, so uh, that's for whites and then orange dots are for blacks and green for Hispanics. I know it's a little hard to see, but, um, and then uh, red for Asians. Okay, just to kind of give you an idea that, you know, the, the white um, Airbnb sample, sample is, sorry, the Uber sample. That's for a reason, um, because if you look at occupancy by race or who owns homes in San Francisco, there is a big disparity here. So, um, the light blue tells you owner occupied housing units and you can see that for whites, you know, they own about 50, more over 50% of, of these housing units, followed by Asians, Hispanics, Blacks and other races. Okay, so if we were just making a point about this, we would say that lower, there's a lower likelihood of being an Airbnb host among Hispanics and Blacks versus Asian and whites due to a lower uh, percentage of owner occupied housing. And so here we can see um, two pie charts. The one on the right is telling you what is the San Francisco demographic like, right? So San Francisco is about 42% white. This is the 2010 census. This is the, the one we have, right? There's a 2020 census that is just happening uh, election year. Um, there's 42%, this is 42% white, 30 4% Asian, 15% uh, Hispanic, and 6% Black, and then 3.2% other. But when we look at our sampled Airbnb listings, as you, you saw in that map just now, uh, most of those uh, listings are 74% are by whites, okay, and so on and so forth. So we don't, we, we obviously know that these don't have to match up. This is all because of who owns the house or houses in San Francisco. So let's ask this question then to put everything together. What determines listing prices on Airbnb? So if you really, if we really had to come up with five broad uh, categories, we would say that uh, rental listing features, which, which are things like the number of bedrooms, bathrooms, the unit type, whether are you renting out a whole apartment or a private room or a shared room, um, the number of guests you are uh, accommodating, social media profiles, all of these other things, your cancellation policies, all of these things would drive uh, prices. And what we were interested in was host characteristics. So, you know, this was again a data set that was curated by my students. Like I said, um, this would give us information on the host race, gender, couple status, um, sexual orientation, uh, et cetera. We can also imagine that user reviews that are posted on the Airbnb host page uh, also play a role in prices. So somebody who's reviewed uh, or a listing that is reviewed highly might uh, be more expensive. And so we have a lot of information on this from inside Airbnb uh, on overall, overall reviews, reviews for cleanliness, communication by the host, and also um, on something known as a super host. So Airbnb classifies hosts uh, uh, into super hosts uh, if they have reached key hospitality goals that reflect the host experience and dedication, right? So you, you have that type of a dummy uh, in, in your model as well. And uh, number four, we have a, a rich set of neighborhood characteristics. So we know the average cost per square foot, um, depending on which neighborhood the listing is located in. Um, we know the median income, and uh, we can also control for racial demographics, looking at the census data. So we do that. And finally, we control for occupancy rates. And here we look at the average monthly occupancy rate because we think that might drive um, 
our, our main variable of interest, which is the price per day uh, per unit of that listing. So, you know, for those who are interested in, you know, how we are doing this, the major part of this uh, research was really the data collection, right? This part was easy, what I'm showing you here. We simply take the prices, we log that and we regress it on all of these different set of um, controls, renting, rental listing features, host features, user reviews, neighborhood characteristics, and occupancy rates. So if you're interested, you can go to the paper and look at this busy table, uh, but this describes exactly all of the variables under each heading that we had and how we manipulated it and where we got it from. So we had five sources of data inside Airbnb, the host's profile, which was manu manually cre created. There was Trulia that we used for uh, neighborhood um, real estate values and the US census and finally, you know, when, when we were at that stage of trying to publish this work, um, the referees really wanted us to look at occupancy and we actually had to purchase this data. This was the only thing we spent on really, apart from our time, uh, which was going to air DNA and actually buying that data because this wasn't available anywhere. So, you know, when we were doing this, uh, you know, when we had all of this data and we were doing this exploratory analysis, uh, we found something very interesting. We created these bar charts uh, that told us about, or that, uh, that described average listing price by race, by the type of unit here. So um, the colors tell you whether it's a private room, a studio, a one bedroom or a two bedroom, but just for the heck of it, let's try to just look at the dark green bars, which are uh, the prices of two bedrooms or the, um, not the price, but the pr average listing price on Airbnb per day uh, for two bedrooms. And then the panels here show you uh, whether these are, uh, what the prices are by race. So the first panel is for whites. Uh, and you can see this is, this price is just a little uh, less than $300. And for Asians, uh, this is a little over $250. And for Hispanics, uh, it's again, shy of $200. So so again, you, you know, here just eyeballing, you know that there is something going on, but we wanted to understand uh, it with all of those rich set of controls. Uh, when we looked at um, our data, uh, we found that the average price per night uh, was $203. This is, uh, you know, for 2015 data that we are looking at, $203 uh, per night, but there's a big range. So, you, you know, the because our sample listings contain listings that were uh, shared rooms versus listings that were entire apartments, there was a big range here. So you could uh, rent out for $40 a night versus you know, the maximum was $1,250 a night, big range there. And the majority of units, uh, like we saw, uh, close to 70% were whole apartments that were rented out. The average number of bedrooms was one, accommodating about two to three guests, and about 22% of hosts in our sample were super hosts, right? So they had met that hospitality uh, benchmark. And the average occupancy rate was 69%, right? You can imagine San Francisco is a popular destination for tourists, so this would be high uh, all year round. In fact, these reach 100, close to 100%. Uh, during Christmas time. So when we look at our model, we basically do different regression iterations. Um, and I, I'll just describe this uh, in a very non-technical way. What we are trying to do is understand how much of all these variables that we have can explain the variation in prices, okay? So our first model, which is uh, very conservative, is just looking at rental unit features and host race. And so these together can explain about 66% of the variation in price. And as we add different uh, variables like additional host, as you, add, as you add these different variables that I talked about, you know, we achieve uh, greater success. We are able to explain about 81% of the variation in prices based on all of the uh, variables that we had. 
so won't talk about the table here, but what do we find um, really that the type of unit matters, right? So if you're for prices, so the type of unit, meaning whether it's a shared apartment, it's a, a, a shared uh, room or a private room in an apartment or an uh, entire apartment would matter for prices. And there's of course a huge premium. So, you know, th this uh, right here means that as relative to a shared room, um, a whole apartment would be priced 140% higher, okay, which is very intuitive. Um, the minimum number of nights of stay is significant, and that affects price negatively, but, uh, you know, this is uh, not, in, in terms of magnitude, isn't very high. And then, you know, what we were interested in here was that, uh, you know, what is the effect of race on prices? So we found that controlling for all these factors, Asians and Hispanics charge about eight to 10% lower for equivalent rentals, right? So this, this is something that we would try to explain uh, in our paper. And then we found that listings from African-American or black hosts were very few in our sample and that led to the insignificant results. So we only had about, I think, four to 6% uh, um, four to six listings, I should say, not percent um, in our sample that were uh, for African-American hosts. And we also found that a gender, sexual orientation, and couple status did not play a significant role in, in determining prices. Um, we found that user reviews and super uh, host status was significant in, in determining prices. And then the rich set of neighborhood controls that we had um, like real estate values, median income, area demographics was significant. So here we can see that, you know, when we look at uh, maybe percentage of Asians or percentage of Hispanics is insignificant, but percentage of whites is significant. Again, the magnitude is small, but uh, you know, this is significant for prices. And the occupancy rate is significant as well. So what we were interested in was looking at the economic impact of just having an 8% uh, lower price for your listing if you were Hispanic or Asian, uh, based on the average room rate of $203 uh, per night and an average occupancy rate of 69% for the entire year. And so this creates a revenue gap of $4,100 per year, which is substantial, right? This is non-trivial. And so uh, this is the economic impact of pricing uh, your unit lower. Um, what I want to do is spend maybe a couple of minutes on explaining why there might be differences in, that we observe across racial groups in, in host pricing. So one explanation is, uh, I know some of your economic students or have a business background in the audience, you would understand this if you uh, think about it from the demand side, which means that if you are a potential renter and you log on to Airbnb and now you are looking at these profiles, you obviously have a potential to discriminate um, uh, against different attributes of Airbnb hosts. Now, you can imagine that there is a, um, you know, in your simple price and quantity uh, supply and demand framework, there's a supply and a demand, and there would be sort of a fair price, which is P1, right? But then um, if people are discriminating on Airbnb and they are bypassing Airbnb units of minority hosts, this would lead supplier price, this would lead to supplier price adjustments. So Airbnb hosts would adjust their prices because they maybe are facing a slacker or a lower demand, and that would lead to lower revenues. Or in other words, one other way to look at it would be that um, people are okay paying a discrimination premium um, to stay with white hosts or to rent out from white hosts, right? So here what happens is in the diagram, you can almost see that that slacker demand is reflected in um, Asian or Hispanic hosts or minority hosts facing this other demand curve, which is lower than that actual demand curve, right? They're not getting as much uh, as many hits on their on their page, right? So what happens is you end up with a price of P2, which is lower than P1, right? So that that's something that might be going on on the demand side if there was possible discrimination. If
if you look at the supply side, then one argument could be that Airbnb hosts, the ones who are minorities, uh, might not actually have lower occupancy relative to white hosts if they are responding to this slacker demand in real time uh, by adjusting their prices, right? Or the other ex explanation could be that they have some sort of a target occupancy rate that they have to achieve, and so they are adjusting their prices in real time. Um, there might be a social motive to price lower. Uh, minorities could price lower to draw from a large pool of potential guests to choose from. So there could be some sort of reverse discrimination that, that might be going on. There's no way we can say this is it for sure. But these are all the different explanations that, that can be offered. Okay, and so um, if we think that the way minorities are pricing is actually the fair price, then maybe it is the case that whites are pricing higher to attract a certain clientele or, or people from a higher social status. So what can be done in the future? Let's take a look. Uh, one, of course, is to do more qualitative interviews with minority hosts and even white hosts to, to understand why do, why do they price the way they do? What goes into their uh, function? And what role does seasonality play? So if, if we looked at San Francisco um, around Pride Parade, looking at maybe LGBTQ friendly neighborhoods would give us more insights into is there a premium to stay with uh, uh, an LG host, right? And so uh, right around Pride Parade. And so, uh, you know, this we think our results can vary based on when the study is co uh, conducted. And uh, it would be interesting to study very different demographic or uh, geographic Airbnb markets. Example, um, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, 54% uh, of the uh, population is African American or Black. Right? And so it would be interesting to see when um, minorities are in the majority in a, in a particular place, what happens to, to prices and whether uh, is there potential discrimination going on or not. And similarly in Alhambra, California, uh, which is 50, 53% Asian. And also in India, right? So I was yesterday, I was just looking at the, the Airbnb um, website in India and you know, you have the same thing. You have uh, names that are listed of Airbnb hosts. You have, uh, you can uh, uh, see if religion or caste or other things play a role uh, in influencing prices. So what I want to talk about is this really big picture question on what can platforms do? Um, because this, this uh, study has focused on peer-to-peer e-commerce -peer e and complex issues that arise with it, um, some of the design features on online platforms uh, can make uh, discrimination uh, difficult, okay? And so I want to talk about it uh, for a second. So the first thing here would be that most companies that are providing this, uh, these platforms should not ignore that there's a potential for people to discriminate. Uh, platforms should know and publish the racial and gender composition or other characteristics of their transaction participants. And also measure um, each group's success or failure on the platform, okay? Uh, to, uh, to see whether, you know, everyone's uh, benefiting from the platform. And also these, the companies already have this, but, you know, having and maintaining that experimental mindset would help reduce discrimination on online platforms. So to ask questions like, are we providing too much information? Uh, how prominent should that information be? So, you know, for example, earlier you could see the Airbnb host profile, you know, just by click on, clicking on it, you have this whole thing that's blown up, you know, on your computer screen. Is that necessary? Can we maybe highlight uh, user reviews or guest reviews that, that uh, tell us more about the experience of, of guests uh, at, at that unit. Um, so Airbnb actually had done this study or had done this experiment where uh, they withheld host photographs from its main search results page. And they wanted to explore what, are, what is the effect of withholding those host photographs on, the, on booking outcomes. And so while they conducted this study, they never made the results public. 
Okay, so to making it, by making it public, uh, you know, there would be a, a more, uh, a, a bigger discussion on these topics. Um, another design aspect that can help uh, reduce or mitigate discrimination is by automating transactions so and, and making it more difficult for people to discriminate. So, for example, Airbnb has a feature called Instant Book, which we actually use uh, in one of our variables in rental listing features. This Instant Book feature allows renters to book a property without having to be uh, approved by the host. So maybe this is middle of the night, you're trying to book an Airbnb and you know, there, maybe the Airbnb host is gonna wake up next morning. So you don't have to wait until next morning to make your reservation. You can book right now uh, because usually what happens is the Airbnb host might ask you a few questions before actually approving your request. Might want to know your name, might want to know uh, other features about you and ha maybe at that point they can actually discriminate. So. Um, those are some design features. And, and finally, um, making users accept non-discrimination policies when, they may, when they're uh, transacting on Airbnb each time. Okay, so usually what, what happens is that you log on as a guest uh, or as a renter on Airbnb and you have to sign this non-discrimination agreement, which looks like this. Which says, um, before you continue, whether it's your first time using Airbnb or you're one of our original travelers, please commit to respecting and including everyone in the Airbnb community. I agree to treat everyone in the Airbnb community regardless of their race, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation or age with respect and without judgment or bias. And so you have to accept or decline. And there are studies that show that, you know, this is like a nudge, um, you know, each time you're doing a transaction, if someone is in that space where they might be doing something wrong, this might be a nudge and, and remind them that they shouldn't do it. Rather than just having it, uh, having this put up in the beginning when you signed up for Air Airbnb, and that might not be as effective. Okay, so with that, I thank you all for listening. And uh, this paper is published in the Journal of Housing Economics. And here is a QR code. Uh, my sister, in fact, uh, gave me this idea yesterday that I should put up this QR code in case people want to go to this directly. And uh, in case we don't get through all of get through all of the questions or comments today, you f please feel free to write to me and feel free to connect on on social media as well. I'm happy to take any questions now. Oh, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Kakar. That was an amazing, uh, amazing discussion. Um, uh, when I can see questions are pouring in, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we'll probably not have time to take all the questions, but you know, we'll sure take some. Um, uh, you know, I'll just take a little bit of advantage of uh, being the moderator here. So I'll just, I'll just start with my question. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, so you know, your paper has, uh, your research has discussed about uh, uh, the discrimination against the guests, right? Um, uh, I was just, you know, going through uh -huh. this, uh, yeah, sorry, the hosts, yes. So I was, I was just, you know, going through the, uh, uh, the Airbnb's uh, page a couple of days back, and I saw that, you know, they are coming up with uh, this new policy called Project Lighthouse. Right and uh, uh, and where uh, you know where they talk about the dis discrimination about the guests, right? So you know some anti-discrimination initiative uh, against the guests. I, I guess you know there have been some incidents uh, in some parts of uh, of the United States where I mean even police were called on the premises or you know the hosts they have written uh, not so nice things about the guests, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that, uh, I mean, that is, that is also another sort of problem. So how, uh, how can that be addressed? So what do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you asked this because I, I purposefully didn't touch upon that, uh, that side of discrimination, you know, where uh, hosts are actually discriminating against potential guests. Yes. And, uh, and, and this, this, there is a study, in fact, the same authors, uh, Luca and Edelman, who, who yeah. did the New York study, uh, wrote a paper on this where they experimented with sending emails to hosts uh, yeah. with white sounding or uh, black sounding names. And mm -hmm. it's the exact same email, right? About inquiring about an Airbnb um, 
a potential uh, listing, uh, a potential unit. And they, they found that uh, black hosts, sorry, black renters, I should say black renters, were less likely to receive a positive response than white hosts, right? For the same email, for the same inquiry, just based on the name um, that was there in the email. So the, there is a precedence of this type of discrimination that we can observe from experiments. And so that's why I was mentioning in the last, let me go back to that slide, uh, when we talk about maintaining an experimental mindset, you know, th these types of experiments help a lot uh, on, uh, in design. So automating transactions and making instant book as a default feature on Airbnb, right? So if you are a host, you have to actively, uh, you know, uh, uncheck that box where you don't want to do instant booking is going to reduce that type of discrimination, right? That, that's, that's a design feature, at least, that can help. Uh, that's, that's but but uh, I mean, so, so uh, I mean, uh, I, I just can't you know, stop thinking about it, right? So right now, what is going on all over the world uh, uh, about racial discrimination is a big thing. It's probably the biggest issue that you have, apart from, you know, other political issues. Uh, so, you know, this kind of findings, you know, it can, you know, if, of course, I mean, so, I, this can really, really hurt uh, uh, of the company that, you know, the hosts are being, there is a possibility that hosts are being discriminated mm -hmm. against or the guests are being discriminated against, right? So uh, uh, what would be your policy recommendation uh, apart from, you know, the, what Airbnb is doing right now? What can be a good way to minimize these discriminations? I think the biggest thing that, uh, I would say, I, I, you know, I don't mean to speak about Airbnb in a bad space here. I think Airbnb is a platform. And I think since this study was published, even the New York City study was published, um, they have made a, a very good effort to create an anti-discrimination unit. They have uh, made, uh, uh, made sure that they, are, that they are hiring a very diverse uh, uh, workforce. Because only if you hire a very diverse workforce would you be able to understand the, you know, you would be able to make your platform uh, serve everyone. So that, you know, if you look at, since you, you've been on their website, you know that they are publishing um, statistics on, you know, how many uh, African-Americans or how many Hispanic uh, folks are there in their managerial position or how many are engineers, how many women are they employing in different positions. So they are, you know, that's one step, I think, employing a diverse works, a work for, force and even publishing uh, those statistics, which most tech companies fail to do. I'm yet to see Google try to do that or some other tech com big tech companies do that. Airbnb is already doing that. They've set up an anti-discrimination unit and uh, they are experimenting with different features and they're not, you know, um, opposed to this experimental mindset. Um, so I think this is, in terms of policy recommendations, it all comes from experiments. And while, you know, with the type of discrimination that you were talking about, uh, which is, you know, much easier to say that that is discrimination, what we are inferring is these price differences that, uh, that exist, right? And so we can offer different explanations, but, and we can only say this is potentially discrimination. We don't know for sure or what's going on. So keep, you know, keeping on that, uh, keep, keep, you know, keep going on that research and keeping uh, um, your eyes open uh, and, and just uh, doing this data analysis uh, would, would help. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Atul. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'll just take some questions from our students. Uh, so the first question is from our MBA student, Amit Pandey. And he asks, Amit asks, you know, what are the legal reasons that uh, a host can reject a prospective guest? Also, can a prospective guest sue the host for discrimination in federal or state court? Uh, Amit, you you asked a difficult question. I I don't. So I you know I was uh, very close to having a slide up on litigation and legal issues uh, in my presentation today, but I purposefully um, uh, ignored that. And and here is a question on it. Airbnb does not have. Um, does not have to worry about uh, discrimination lawsuits. It's a third party 
And I think the Housing Discrimination Act of 1968 protects Airbnb in some ways. I don't know the fine print of it because I'm not an, a corporate lawyer, but I know that whenever this comes up in the news, you know, someone's uh, suing Airbnb for this or that, um, you know, it's a third party and uh, this is not, what they can do, what, what Airbnb can do uh, legally is they can tell the host that you're no longer, because you did this, you are no longer part of Airbnb. You are no longer uh, going to post any profiles and you will not have access to this uh, platform to, to do business. So Airbnb can uh, remove uh, any potential user, whether it's a renter or a host, who is, who is acting um, badly, right? And so whether you're writing nasty reviews or racist comments, you're sending out emails on their platform that are racist, things like that, so that they can do something about it. But as far as you know, suing Airbnb uh, goes, I think they're pretty clear on that. I hope that uh, answers. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, my next question is from you know, my colleague, uh, Dr. Anshu Sharma. And uh, Dr. Sharma asks, uh, you know, do we have data on guests demography? What kind of guests, white versus other hosts, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Sharma. Um, I don't believe uh, we have information on that. I, I can tell you, uh, you know, from the time I rented, uh, the host had asked me for my name. So the only thing I can think about is that a potential host could look you up, you know, based on your name. And if you have a social media profile, they can stalk you and they can figure out who you are. Uh, but as far as, you know, um, for studies and for research, we don't have that information. Unfortunately, we don't have that information. Uh, but from the study that I was just describing to Dr. Sen earlier, uh, with the experiment where the names uh, matter, right, for uh, who is being discriminated on the platform, uh, that, that, that information you have to put in because you, you do put in your name at some point when you're booking. Uh, so Dr. Sh Sharma has another follow-up question. Uh, she reads, you know, can we also look at host guest mapping data to see if price difference is due to race-based discrimination? Uh, so, so say that, maybe you can explain that to me. Uh, uh, you know, I'd request if, if Dr. Sharma is here, uh, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Sure. Um, hi, Professor Zain. Hi, uh, Professor Kathar. Thank you for a very lovely talk. So I am from HR area and this, uh, you know, this title of your paper was very interesting. So I joined up. So I was thinking, so uh, when you were talking about uh, price differences um, in the host and everything, so I was thinking in my mind so is when we are, you know, confirming it that whether it the price difference is due to race based dis uh, discrimination, if we have to, you know, um, prove that, uh, can we use this host uh, guest mapping in uh, like again the same follow-up question that which hosts are attracting what kind of guests so if we are able to you know map this data we'll be able to confirm that yes this price difference is actually coming from uh, you know a race or any ethnicity background which is at X. so if if whites are attracting non-whites then i think this price uh, difference is not race-based uh, discrimination, right? So if we are able to prove that or counterintuitive anything, so we have to look at the data of this host and guest mapping. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think this is again for the company to release, right? They see all the transactions, data, um, you know, and, and more intricate details about this, the, these transactions of which host was declining what, you know, or what request. Uh, and by whom, and things like that. So if we have, you know, in, in the utopian world, I think your point is well taken because if we are able to map it, nothing like it, then we know exactly uh, who is uh, renting to who. Yeah, so if we if we are in terms of, if we have time, like, um, or we can connect later. So um, uh, if we are able to look at users of Airbnb and we can, you know, ask them, so we would, uh, the kind of host they have already, you know, stayed at, and we can go, you know, backwards. So if we can see users and what kind of hosts they have stayed in the past, 
maybe um, from that, that that is also a good way of connecting us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think qualitative interviews, like I said, would really shed light on on what's going on and what what experiences people share. But there's a lot th that's on the internet already. I think you know, right. guest reviews. Uh, a lot of it would would uh, would shed light on the issue that you're talking about. But yeah, that that's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Cocker. Uh, and we have another question from a student, Anshu Jain, and she's uh, an MBA student. And she asks, Anshu asks, you know, what are the factors determining the desirability of locations? Uh, so, I mean, we had, I had a chat with Anshu about this in a, uh, a couple of days back. Uh, she went through your paper and, uh, you know, what I understand what she means is that, you know, how, how do you quantify the desirability of location? Is it the zip code? So is it, you know, uh, near the bay, how do you do that? Yeah, um, you know, I think, uh, San, uh, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to speak about San Francisco here. I cannot talk about any other location, but um, for San Francisco, uh, price is a big factor, right? A desirability of location is, is, is depending dependent on how, how much uh, your budget allows you uh, to spend on, and and so uh, that's one. You know, walkability score scores or are available for many many uh, uh, different uh, places. You know, which which tells you is this close to a shopping area? Is this close to a mall? Is this close to a, a tourist destination? Is this close to the local metro uh, and things like that? So proximity scores, uh, you know, are there. Um, there are, um, what else, uh, desirability. Yeah, I think walkability and like these, uh, these types of proxies that, you know, that would tell you about, you know, whether you should, safety, I would say, you know, that's another thing. Uh, when you're staying, let's say in downtown San Francisco, not all the neighborhoods are safe. So that might be one of the things that uh, guests might look for maybe in user reviews or maybe even in uh, the description that hosts provide uh, where they list exact, you know, the, you don't actually get the address of the location uh, of the unit. Uh, when you go on to Airbnb, it tells you, well, we're two blocks away from this place, X place, uh, or uh, this, you know, or the Embarcadero is two, three blocks away, things like that. Or you can catch the you know, metro and you can get here in so many minutes, things like that. So that would drive desirability of, of the unit. So uh, all these uh, all these aspects, I mean, uh, how far is it from the metro? How far is it from uh, the shopping district and in the walkability? So uh, uh, are these all like separate indicators or has there been an index, you know, which kind of uh, gives out the desirability of a location, you know, which yeah. kind of yeah, I think there is an index called the walkability score. Okay. okay. This is code that gives you that it's an index that okay. tells you about how far or the proximity to shopping malls, tourist attractions and things like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, I know that you're running out of time and it's past midnight in San Francisco. So I'll just take, if you don't mind, uh, in a couple more questions and after that you can probably wrap up. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, so one one student, I can see that uh, it's it has come from a student, but I can see the name. And he asked, you know, how the religion, color, or caste affect the rental process. We have already spoken about uh, the race, but do you think that religion or caste might also have an impact uh, on the rental process? Absolutely. Uh, I I think that this this remains to be investigated. You know, and so, so since you said this this is an MBA student, I think you should take that on as a project and investigate, even if it's, you know, just for a neighborhood and just see what you find um, based on names that can signal religion or um, if people are signaling religion. But again, like, you know, keeping that seasonality in mind. So uh, thinking about if it's a Muslim name, uh, you know, what impact would, um, religion have right around Eid versus not, things like that. And so that would be interesting to see. I absolutely agree. All of these attributes uh, can matter for prices. Thanks. Uh, and the, I'll take the last question and sorry everyone, uh, you know, whose questions uh, we could not take today. 
I mean, you can write to me and I'll pass on those questions to Dr. Kakar. So the last question has come from Gaurav Jinesh and Gaurav asks, uh, where does the future of businesses like Airbnb, and you know, I think you know, he's meaning the P2P businesses, uh, where does the future of businesses like Airbnb lie post the US elections with regard to the current socio-political atmosphere? Oh, I, I don't know if I am the right person to ask <laughs> this for or answer this question. Um, I think right now um, Airbnb has definitely taken a hit. I can only speak about, you know, not the political process so much, but, but the economics of it. Uh, with the pandemic going on, of course, people are not traveling uh, as much as they, they used to. Um, so that that industry has taken a hit. And uh, despite that, like I had mentioned in the beginning, Airbnb still plans to uh, go ahead with their IPO. Um, so they're pretty confident, I think, in, in terms of where the company is today and uh, uh, where it's going to go in the future. And to kind of give you background, Airbnb started in 2007 and it was called Airbnb bed and a breakfast, right? Where people would just crash on a mattress at somebody's house and it was very cheap, right? And as uh, the, the founders of, uh, you know, thought that, okay, you know, sometimes there's a conference or some event happening in a major city where all the hotels are booked. Wouldn't it be nice if people just uh, rented out their spaces? And that's how it was formed. So since then, we have seen that Airbnb has just, the growth has been exponential. And so I think it has a br very bright future <laughs> from the economic standpoint. I don't think politics is, is going to play a role here. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for uh, you know being with us today, and uh, notwithstanding the glitches uh, that you had at the beginning, and, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I mean uh, staying up such late at night answering patiently every single question that we have thrown at you, and uh, you know I really hope when the world returns to normalcy or the things become better, then we'll have uh, we'll have. Uh, you know, the opportunity to host you in the campus where you can meet our students in person, you can interact with other faculties and, uh, you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that probably that day is not, uh, uh, I mean, too far in the future. We'll probably be able to host you in campus very soon. And once again, thank you very much. Thanks a lot on behalf of JGBS. Thanks a lot on behalf of the Center for Research in uh, Emerging Economies. And uh, you know, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and uh, uh, I mean, sharing these insights. This, uh, this has been fascinating. This has been a fascinating lecture. Thank you, thank you Dr. Sen, and thank you for everyone who joined and, and I really enjoyed my discussion. I think they, these were really insightful questions. Some really got me thinking as to you know, some of the other avenues where I could pull this research. And so uh, thank you for joining and, and please take care everyone and stay in touch. And I look forward to coming to your campus when, when things are back to normal. Until then, bye-bye. Bye, thank you, thank you very much.